Shabbat shalom, everybody. Recently, I watched the interview between Meghan Markle and Prince Harry and Oprah. Now, mind you, I'm really not somebody who's into the royal family in any way. In fact, I've never really paid attention before. But this interview caught my attention. And I think for a reason that's important. What was revealed in that interview was that there was a call, a call that no one heard, a call in a palace that was silenced. There was so much pain when life appeared to be so perfect. Behind the royal veil, there was a crisis, a crisis unheeded. Meghan Markle was suicidal and could not get help, even though she tried. Listen to her words. And look, I was really ashamed to say it at the time, she tells Oprah, and ashamed to have to admit it to Harry, especially because I know how much loss he suffered, but I know, knew that if I didn't say it, I would do it. And I, I just didn't want to be alive anymore. And that was a very clear and real and frightening constant thought. And I remember, I remember how he just cradled me. And I, I went to the institution and I said that I needed to go somewhere to get help. I said that I've never felt this way before. I need to go somewhere. And I was told that I couldn't. It wouldn't be good for the institution. They took her car keys, her credit cards, her license. She was essentially a prisoner in the palace. And as she says, she could not just call an Uber and go to a psychiatric hospital. I wonder often about our calls to one another, about when we call and when we keep silent, about how we do and don't respond to one another's calls, about what's at stake in calling out and in responding to the call. So as you heard earlier, this week we start a new book. And one could really call it the book of the calling. It starts with the word Vayikra, and he called. It's a really interesting way to start the book because the call is anonymous. We don't know till the next sentence that it's God who's calling. Vayikra el Moshe, and he called to Moses. All we know about this call is that it's singular and the gender is male. The first verse of Leviticus continues. And God spoke to him, and now we can assume it's Moses, from the tent of meaning. Vayidaber Adonai elav me ohel moed lemor, saying. We have all the details we need to make sense of what is going on here. God is speaking to Moshe from the tent of meeting, the place that God dwells. But now that we have all the specifics, let's return to those first three words, Vayikra el Moshe, and he called to Moses and ask, why does this book begin with an anonymous call? And to make matters even more mysterious, if we look at this word in the Torah scroll, the little Aleph, the last, the last letter of this verb, and he called, is, um, is written in a way that's tiny. That olive is really small. So the mysteries of this word multiply. We don't know who the caller is, and it's written in an anom anomalous way with a teeny olive. What is this pointing towards? How are we to make sense of this? Many of the Hasidic masters address this small olive and the anonymity of this verb and say that it's all about simsum, God's contraction, the same contraction that gave birth, gave rise to the entire world. The idea is that God has to limit God's power so other things can exist. And if God doesn't limit God's call, none of us will be able to hear this. This is reflected in legends about Revelation where it says that God spoke to each of us at Sinai according to our own capacity. 
God modulated God's voice to every single individual, an amazing divine capacity. Because it's not, it's just not possible to hear God's unmodulated voice and certainly not possible to hear it and then respond. I can just imagine going into a kind of trance upon hearing it. So how do we function and hear the call? Our Torah, our sacred book, our sacred master narrative is such a beautiful example of so many calls, such variety. Consider the story that of the holiday that we just came from, Purim. The Jewish people were imperiled and Mordechai needed to somehow communicate with Esther in the palace. So Mordechai parks himself in front of the palace gates. He's wearing sackcloth. He raises up his voice and just simply wails. And he sends a message to Esther. When she kind of balked at his you know, wearing sackcloth and said to him, like, I can't possibly approach the king. I can't possibly respond to your call. I can't possibly help you at this moment, even though my people were imperiled. He said to her, don't think to yourself that you shall es escape in the king's palace more than all the Jews. For if you remain silent at this moment, then relief and deliverance will arise to the Jews from another place. And you and your family will perish. And who knows? And who knows whether you have not come to royalty, to this position in the palace for such a time as this. And so she springs, hearing this, hearing Mordechai's refined call, she springs into action. She commands Mordechai to fast. And this whole book until now, the first three chapters of, of the book of Esther, he's commanding her. Now she commands him to fast. And for all the people of Israel to fast, she dresses in royal garb and she approaches the king with a brilliant strategy that works. Esther saves her people. Mordechai calls, Esther responds, and then Esther calls. And if we look forward to the book of, to the story of Passover, right? It's coming fast. It's fast upon us. We find another palace and more calls. First, Moshe leaves the palace and sees the suffering of his people. Then he intervenes on behalf of seven Midianite women not his people, just simple human beings trying to draw water for their sheep while shepherds are dry, driving them away. He hears the call of these women. Finally, he hears the voice of God of the burning bush. He responds with great and even tortured ambivalence, but he hears. Two palaces. Esther hears the voice in the palace and hatches a plan. She saves her people. Moses leaves the royal palace and hears the suffering his, of his people, hears the human voice of suffering, and finally hears God's voice su summoning him from the bush and appointing him as a leader who will take his people out of Egypt. So we have before us now three palaces, the palace of Ahashverosh, the palace of the Pharaoh, and the, British, and the British palace. The palace is such a potent, symbol in Jewish tradi tradition and beyond, always featured in a fairy tale, in a myth. When Mordechai says to Esther, you cannot hide in the palace, I hear something larger than just the reality of a physical palace. I hear that each of us cannot hide in what keeps us safe, in our own privilege, in our own security. Mordechai knew that Esther's safety was an illusion. If we don't live in a world in which we keep each other safe, then none of us are safe. We can't hide in our own palaces. We can't hide in our own privilege. This past week, I was visiting my mother in Florida. I haven't been able to visit her very often because of the pandemic. The last time I saw her was October. I happened to be staying in a, in a hotel and in the hotel elevator, I, I heard and saw all kinds of things. Um, 
uh, people on masks, people sort of half masks. You could, it barely felt like an, a pandemic. But I heard a conversation the first day I was there that really shocked me. Two men were speaking and one said, I had COVID last February when everything just started. And what the former president said about COVID was correct, about the virus was correct. And what he said is this is a China virus that somehow they had really screwed us over. And then he muttered something about liberals and their responsibility for all this that I didn't really understand. So this was Sunday night. There I was in the elevator with them and I just stared. I wanted to say something, to disagree, to speak out, to answer the call of justice that I was hearing in my own head, but I could not think of one thing to say. Certainly not in the minute that we were together on the elevator. I was frozen, I was speechless. Two days later, a young man went on a shooting rampage at three spas in Atlanta, killed eight people. Six of them were women of Asian descent. I began to think about the lines between our former president's rhetoric to the language of those men in the elevator to hatred and violence and mass shooting. We're still learning about what motivated that horrific crime, but no matter what the cumulative, no matter what the commute, sorry, cumulative effect of language, like the language I heard in the elevator fuels hatred, fuels violence. I heard that call, I heard the call of justice, but I did not respond to it. I'm trying to respond to it now by sharing this story with you. Leviticus is the book of the call. And it's actually a book about offering, about sacrifice, about korbanot. The word korban has within it closeness. Kuf, kuf resh vav. Every time we offer, we come closer. We, have co we come closer to God. At the beginning of the book is the call, and that call is a call for Moses to come closer to God. The book describes in endless detail the technology of sacrifice, of coming closer through an offering. Each of us issues calls daily, asking others to come closer to us. And each of us hears calls daily. When we utter a call, there is something we need to give up in order to come close, to sacrifice. When I was in that elevator, perhaps I needed to sacrifice some of my own discomfort, my own fear at approaching a stranger. Perhaps there's something I could have said. I'm eager to actually hear from you if you want to email me about what, what could I have done in that, in that moment that would have been meaningful. Esther in the palace risked her life. Moses is the bush. Sacrifice living a normal life in order to stand as a deliverer of his people. When we hear the cries of other human beings, we might also hear the first word of Leviticus, Vayikra, that an anonymous divine call with a small aleph, God's contraction, God's simpson in the divine call. The anonymity of God's call allows us to imagine the echo of the divine call in each call, the call of our conscience, the call of our children, the call of the people around us, the call of the widow, the orphan, and the stranger. The divine call refracted through so many human calls, so many human cries for help. Maybe we, we be strong enough to hear the call and to respond to the call. <laughs>